school and welcome for the lesson. My name is Madam Beth Mwangi from the School of Hospitality, Travel and Tourism Management, Department of Hospitality Management. Uh, our unit is uh, DHT 2114, Food Hygiene and Hazards Control. Welcome. We are going to look at the basics of food hygiene and uh, to our objectives, the lesson objectives. Uh, by the end of the lesson, you should be able to identify essentials of maintaining food hygiene. You should also be able to identify common terms applied in food hygiene. And you should be able to describe the rules of personal hygiene. Uh, we have some definitions of terms, some terms that you need to understand as we continue with the study of food hygiene. The first one is food hygiene. Of course, one would ask, what is this food hygiene? And it is simply implies to all conditions and uh, measures that are necessary to ensure the safety and suitability of food at all stages of the food chain. The food chain means food comes from, it has like a chain from the farm all the way to, you know, until the end product uh, is consumed by the customer or the consumer. So what are all the necessary measures? The second um, term to define is a hazard. What is a hazard? And it is simply a biological, it can be biological, chemical, or physical agent, or in condition of food, that has a potential to cause harm or adverse health effect. That's what we call a hazard. Then control. When we talk about food hygiene and hazards control, what do we really mean by control? This is actually a verb. It means taking all necessary actions to ensure and maintain compliance. Then Contamination. What is contamination? Like food contamination. It is simply the introduction or occurrence of a contaminant in food or food environment. Next term is a food handler. Who is a food handler? Now this is basically a person who is directly in uh, who directly handles food, whether it, it is packaged or unpackaged, either food equipment and utensils or food contact surfaces and is therefore expected to comply with food hygiene requirements. That's the person we refer to as a food handler. Food poisoning, what is food poisoning? This is illness that is caused by food contaminated with bacteria, with viruses, with parasites or toxins. That is what we call food poisoning. The next term is cross contamination. And cross contamination is the process by which bacteria or microorganisms are unintentionally transferred from one substance or object to the other, causing harmful effect. That is cross-contamination. Then hygiene. When we talk about hygiene, without talking of either food hygiene or personal hygiene, what does hygiene really mean? Now, this is actually a series of practices that are performed in order to preserve health. And according to the World Health Organization, hygiene refers to conditions and practices that help to maintain health and prevent the spread of diseases. That is general hygiene. But we have personal hygiene. What does personal hygiene mean? Now, this refers to maintaining the body's cleanliness, a person's body cleanliness. Then to the introduction of the basics. Remember, we are looking at the basics of food hygiene. And we talked about food handlers. Now, all the food handlers, if you're handling food, you have the potential or you're a source of contamination to food and through the bacteria and other hazards. And it is therefore important that you are aware of the high standards of personal hygiene that you need to maintain. Now, what does food hygiene really involve? Number one, it involves protecting food from risk of contamination. It involves uh, prevention of organism from multiplying to an extent that it will cause a health risk when consumed. It involves destroying any harmful bacteria uh, in food through treatment or other techniques. Food hygiene also involves uh, prevention against potential to harm customers and employees as well, and protection against potential legal action that the business may face. What are the consequences of foodborne illness or food poisoning as uh, they are commonly known as? Now that is why as food handlers you need to really be very careful because if you're employed or you have your own a business that deals with food, it is important you understand that there could be dire consequences if you don't serve food that is safe 
or suitable for consumption. Consequence number one, loss of customers and sales. Of course, this is very, very uh, serious and it happens. Without regular customers, as a food service operator, you would close your doors. Yes, it happens. You would close your doors because if your customers came and they, they, they got some food poisoning, they are not going to come back there. So that is repercussion number one. You're going to lose your customers and uh, sales. There is also loss of prestige and your reputation. There is what we call, you know, you, you, you like are faced with some embarrassment because of having served some food that is already contaminated and people are talking ill about your hotel, if it is a hotel, or your restaurant, and therefore your reputation will actually be at stake. If you had that prestige, it will no longer be there. So that is basically another negative consequence. Another consequence, you face some legal suits. You're sued by customers. Nowadays, customers are very, people are using the law to really, you know, follow on their rights. Okay? So it is illegal to be unsanitary. The law actually does not prohibit uh, hoteliers or food handlers from, you know, contaminating food or serving food that is already contaminated. And this can lead to fines, closures for violations by unsafe food handling practices. So you're going to be sued, you, you know, you'll have to pay a lot of court fines, you have to get a lawyer, you know, and all that. Huh? The other consequence is that uh, there are increased insurance premiums. Uh, sometimes food poisoning affects also employees of a business like a hotel, and you know, you have to make sure that they, are, they have medical insurance. So this is also another cost to the establishment, okay, when the, there is a foodborne illness or food poisoning happens. Uh, consequence number four, there is lowered employee morale. Nobody would want to be associated with your business, with your hotel. We've heard of hotels that have had cases of food poisoning or foodborne illnesses, and anytime you mention it, you know, everybody has, you know, a negative, you know, negative thinking about it. So employees who are working there, we also have that lowered morale to work. Number five, they can also be absent from work. If they happen to have also consumed food that is contaminated, they may ask for days off to seek for medical attention and therefore they will not, they will miss work. There is the issue of unemployment and loss of earnings. This comes when businesses close. So your employees will be rendered jobless and therefore they will lose their earnings. Now, when food poisoning happens, when there's a foodborne illness, that means it is a pointer that something somewhere is wrong. So it needs retraining of employees. And this training is actually costly in terms of resources, personnel, materials, and all that. So this is another negative consequence of, of foodborne illness. Uh, food poisoning, we're talking about food poisoning. How does it happen? You know, how does it really affect uh, people? Now, basically, food poisoning is actually refers to a group of medical conditions that result from eating food that is already contaminated with harmful bacteria. And it can also be caused from other sources, not only bacteria. We also have metal food poisoning. We have harmful metals. We have viruses. We have parasites. And we have poisonous plants that naturally have poisons, even some poisonous animals like some species of fish. So all that, uh, you know, is what we call food poisoning. It's a group of all those medical conditions. Then we're also going to look at food safety hazards because these hazards are the ones that will lead to food poisoning. Now these are responsible for many food poisoning cases and we classify hazards, main categories of hazards are three, starting with the first one, biological hazard. Now this one is given a lot of attention, especially in the food service industry, because it is responsible for a majority of the foodborne illnesses that we, ha we hear reported and unreported, many food poisoning cases uh, emanate or come from biological hazards. These ones arise from pathogenic microorganisms like bacteria. We also have viruses and we also have parasites. I've just talked about poisonous plants and even animals like fish. So this will cause the biological hazard. Now, when they result, they happen into two ways. When you have uh, food poisoning or foodborne illness from biological origin, either from bacteria, it can be an infection or an intoxication, either of the two. An infection is basically where the bacteria is present in your body and it is causing the disease. An intoxication, you either have the bacteria and causing the disease or it is not there but it is dead and you're, or dead, or, or you're already sick. Um, chemical hazards, that was one, uh, biological hazards, and I've said it is caused by microorganisms that you cannot see with your naked eyes. 
Then we have the chemical hazard. This is actually very, very serious. These are cases that have been there even in Kenya. We have heard of, you know, so many cases of chemical uh, hazards or food poisoning. And they are in three categories. The first one is pesticides and fungicides. The pesticides and fungicides. Animals have to be inoculated with duomas and all that. And plants, they have to be sprayed with uh, pesticides so that they can, you know, to protect them against plant disease and, uh, and all that. And they find their, themselves or their way into the food chain if due diligence is not practiced. Sometimes farmers may not actually clean, you know, this uh, or you may not clean the vegetables well, or you pluck them before the, the, the due dates according to the manufacturer, immediately you sprinkle them. Sometimes we have animals and they are milked uh, before the due dates after they have been uh, dewormed and all that. That is basically how this uh, chemical hazard will reach the end product consumer. That is the pesticides and fungicides. We also have additives and preservatives. These ones, sometimes they are intentionally added into food not with an intention of causing any ill effect because some of them, like the preservatives, they are there to prolong the shelf life of food. But if they are not, uh, if they exceed the safety limit, they become actually a hazard. So we have so many of them, food colors, food preservatives, the nitrites and all that. We also have toxic metals and they include copper, aluminum, ETC. Now most of these metals, sometimes you find them, we use them in cooking, the cooking pots, aluminum pots, copper, ice cube trays, and all that. And sometimes they come into contact with food and they actually cause uh, a hazard. This is a good example. That picture shows uh, the pesticides being used. Uh, plants are actually being sprinkled, you can see. And this is basically how the hazard will reach itself into uh, the customer along the food chain. So that, those are pesticides as chemical hazards. Then we have the physical hazard, the third category of the hazard. Now the physical hazard uh, is basically what you and I can see with your own naked eyes. For example, we have chips of glass, uh, broken glass, uh, falling into your food. Sometimes packaged food, you normally see some establishment. When they package food, they use staplers or staple pins. When a pin falls in, that is actually uh, a hazard, an object that you can actually see with your naked eye. Like for example, in our picture here, in our illustration, you can see the first picture here, we have a screw. That is basically a physical hazard, very risky. The second one, you can see it's a ring. You know, there are many physical hazards that can actually emanate. You have a hook here. All these are physical contaminants or physical hazards. It is something that you can actually see with your naked eye. Uh, then from the hazard we go to now personal hygiene. What are you supposed to do as a food handler? Number one, protective clothing is very, very important. You must don protective clothing so that you can in, uh, actually protect the food. Apart from protect, protecting yourself, you protect the food that will actually be served to your customer. Now this is one to protect food from contamination by the food handlers and to protect the wearer from excessive heat, burns or sharp objects. And it must be light in weight, it must be comfortable, and it must be absorbent. Because in the kitchen you're sweating, there's a lot of perspiration. So if the material is not absorbent, it's going to be very uncomfortable for you. It must also be clean, and it must be changed regularly, most frequently, as it becomes soiled. And it should cover any civilian clothing that you have. Any civilian clothing that you have as, as a food handler, when you get into the kitchen, you remove the clothes and put them in the locker, and then of course you put your, uh, you don't own your protective clothing. Now, it is a requirement. The law requires that this is worn. This is according to the Personal Protective Equipment, that is PPE at work regulations of 1992. Employees must wear personal protective equipment that are suitable for the work they are involved in. And therefore, chefs or food handlers are not an exemption. So when you don't own your protective clothing, you're following the law. It is legal to do that. Now let's look at what does protective clothing in, uh, include. Number one, we have the chef's jacket. The chef's jacket. Now this is usually made of cotton. It should be double-breasted, as we'll see uh, in the diagram. It should also be long-sleeved. And then it should be able to protect the chest and the arms from hot foods, from liquids, scalding your body. Then, of course, after the jacket, we have the whole apparel. You have the trousers. They should also be light in weight. 
They're supposed to be made of cotton material. Cotton is very protective. It doesn't burn fast. It's not like nylon and other, you know, man-made uh, fabrics. This is basically for safety and comfort. Again, cotton is very absorbent. Uh, we have aprons. You must have an apron. These provide extra protection to the body. And of course, they also protect uh, the clothing from being so much uh, soiled. And it must be of sufficient length so that it can be able to be wrapped around your body. And in case of an emergency like a burn, you can be able to actually unwrap it and remove it. We go to the chef's hat. It is another uh, element of protecting clothing. Now this one, the chef's hat helps to prevent loose hair from falling into food. And also, apart from preventing loose hair from falling onto food, the chef's hat will pro absorb any perspiration on your forehead. Then we have the neck scarf. It's a scarf you put on your neck. It helps to absorb any perspiration when you sweat so that it doesn't fall on food. Uh, then we have footwear. You know, you must have, of course, some special type of footwear, not just, you know, any shoes that are supposed to be allowed in the kitchen. Now, this should be strong and in good repair so as to protect and support your feet. Now, as a kitchen staff, as a food handler, you take most of your time, most of the hours you spend standing in the kitchen, and therefore you need footwear that is suitable, that is clean, that is comfortable for you to be able to work in the, uh, in the kitchen. Now, it is not advisable, it is not allowed, eh? that food handlers or chefs in the kitchen, you wear open top shoes or sandals. These ones will not offer any protection in case of any spillage or in case of a sharp object like a knife falling, it will hurt you, it will injure you. So you need to have proper footwear. In fact, the recommended one is what we call, uh, of course, leather. It breathes, it is, it is very, very okay, not plastic leather. It should, be have, it should have a steel toe cap, if affordable, so that in case a knife falls, it will hit on that steel toe cap and it will not actually injure you. That is on um, the footwear. Then characteristics and qualities of this kitchen clothing. How are they supposed to be? Number one, they should be washable. I talked about cotton. It is washable and very hard wearing. It should be light and comfortable, not too heavy. You know, something that is light and comfortable. There's a lot of heat in the kitchen. So if it is not light, if it is not comfortable, you will not also be comfortable working it should be strong and absorbent and that is where cotton is actually recommended because of the frequent uh, cleaning you have to wash it remember we said it has to be kept clean so it has to be strong and uh, absorbent uh, continuation of protective clothing we have what we call white coats this may not be part of every day's uh, kitchen apparel but a white it's basically what we call a dust coat it is usually placed there so that in case a chef wants to go out maybe to take a break or you want to collect something outside of the kitchen, you just simply put on the overcoat or this uh, whatever, uh, the, 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 the white coat, so that it doesn't, you know, you, your chef's clothing is not actually soiled. Uh, next, we have the disposable gloves. Very, very important, especially when you're handling salads with your bare hands. And these are foods that will need not require further cooking, like fruit salads, vegetable salads. You need to wear uh, protective or disposable gloves. At the same time, it is also important for you to note that in case you have an injury maybe on your finger and you're working with food, you must put uh, you know, some uh, bandage blue in color so that it can be seen in case it falls on food. And to avoid that, you put on the gloves, the protective gloves when you have a cut or a bun. Now, this is the picture of a fully dressed chef. From head to toe, we have the talk, this long, you know, chef's hat. Nowadays, there are so many styles. You have even different styles, not necessarily this one. We have the chef's uh, hat, uh, I mean coat, chef's jacket. You can see it is double-breasted on one side and on the other to give protective uh, covering on the chest. We have the apron. This is a dishcloth to be able to use it like wiping on the dishes or even on your hands. And then we have the pants. They have to be loose. The trouser, it has to be loose. The color is bright. They have to be white so that it can be seen when you have any stains. Then you have the shoes. So that's basically how a chef is supposed to be uh, dressed. Uh, after looking at uh, protecting uh, clothing, we have the hands, your hands. Very, very important as a food handler to know that your hands may actually cause a lot of, you know, uh, contamination to food. 
these are the major causes and you need to know when should you clean your hands uh, after visiting the toilet, before commencing your work, during handling of food, then we normally have some procedures. Especially now, we basically know what is understand what is happening. We understand what is going on globally. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Every time we are reminded to wash our hands, and washing our hands is not just for the sake. There is a procedure. Of course, we all know it, but for the sake of reminding ourselves, I'm going to re uh, to repeat it. You wet your hands and running water, apply enough soap and make sure you have good lather, then you rub your hands. You rub them at least for so 20 seconds or longer, including even your, your forearms in between the fingers, very, very important. And then it is important for food handlers in the kitchen, you use a nail brush because under the bed of your nails you could be having some you know although you're not supposed to have long nails but there could be they could be short but maybe there's some dirt so it is important to use a nail brush so that you can clean under the nails or in between the fingers then you rinse your hands very well under running water if possible use a clean disposable towel serve it if you use a towel it it actually recontaminates your hands and then you can or you you can also do, use a hand dryer a warm hand dryer, very safe. Then you dispose of, if you used the disposable serviette or towel, you dispose it off and not in a, dust, in a bin where you'll be able to handle it with your hands. We have what we call pedo operated beans. You simply have to step on it and then uh, it opens and then you dispose of the tissue. Now, when are you to wash your hands? Very quickly, we also remind ourselves, when you enter the kitchen before starting your work of handling any food, after taking a break and especially after visiting the toilet, now between different tasks, especially when you handle raw foods and cooked foods, you wash your hands. After touching, although this is prohibited, it is not allowed. After touching your hair, the nose, the mouth, or, you know, maybe a tissue for coughing or sneezing. Remember, this is not allowed in the kitchen. It is prohibited. But in case it happens quickly, you immediately need to wash your hands. After applying or changing a dressing, sometimes maybe you could have a cut, and you change the dressing immediately, wash your hands before you continue with your work. After handling kitchen waste, you are working on some vegetables you trimmed, you put them in the dustbin, that is waste. Before you continue, clean your hands or even after you handle some money. Sometimes it's inevitable. Now, this is an example of a hand washing facility. As you can see, there is the tap, there is the water and everything else. It should be spacious enough and everything else should be provided so that, you know, it enhances your personal hygiene. Uh, we have the issue of jewelry, rings and watches. They are not recommended in the kitchen, they are prohibited. And because, like, if you can see even the ring I'm having, in between, it can actually be able to, you know, trap some dirt. And basically, as I handle now my food, that dirt is actually going to be uh, transferred to food and contaminating that particular food. Then to fingernails, very, very, very important. They should always be kept short and clean and strictly no nail polish. Varnish in the kitchen is not allowed when you're handling food. Why? Because it could actually chip and get into food, and that becomes actually a contaminant. Uh, the next thing we need to look at after uh, on personal hygiene is actually your head. Your head, very, very important. On, on the head, we have the hair. How should your hair be? Remember, when we talked about our chef, you should be able to cover your head. So the chef's hat basically takes care of that. And in, in this case, the, nowadays we even have chef's hat that come with a net incorporated inside eh, to be able to really contain the hair so that no hair falls on food. Then we have your nose. Now this one should not be touched at all at all. In case you have to sneeze, sometimes this is a natural stimuli. You cannot help sometimes. And maybe you're handling some spices and they, they made you feel like sneezing. You should be able to do it away from food. Then you wash your hands before you continue. The mouth it should also not be touched, and especially the lips, because it contains a lot of bacteria. Actually, it can contaminate food very, very fast, the saliva and all that. So when you're tasting food, you should not actually test you directly on the cooking pot with a spoon. You should do it away, you know, in a manner that will not contaminate the food. The ears, it is always important that you don't handle your ears. You don't even put your finger in the ear like, you know, you, you, you're scratching or you're eating. That should not be done. It is prohibited. Uh, then it is important for food handlers, your health status is very, very, very important. If you're known to be carrying to be, you know, a carrier, a carrier is somebody who has a disease, but they don't show symptoms. If you're known to be a carrier of a certain disease, 
you're not allowed to handle food because you can transmit it to food and in return that can actually uh, affect your customers. So medical examination of food handlers is key. It is important that all food handlers should have a food handler certificate before they are allowed to work. Now it is even more. Uh, the measures are very stringent even to the hospitality industry. Before restaurants and hotels reopen, you now know that it is a requirement that a COVID-19 test has to be done. We are yet to see how that is going to happen, but it is mandatory. It is very, very important, all in the name of protecting uh, customers. Then we have illnesses and injuries. As part of your health status as a food handler, it is important. There are some conditions that when you have them, you're not supposed to actually allow to handle food. It is important to report them to your immediate supervisor so that you're excluded from handling foods. Now, some of them include one, jaundice. Jaundice is basically the yellowing of uh, the eyes, sometimes even the fingers. It is actually a symptom of a disease that you could be suffering from. If you have any diarrhea, you are vomiting, you have some fever, a sore throat, some discharge maybe from the eyes or from the ears or from the nose, maybe you have a cough or you're sneezing, or you have infected skin lesions, like you have a boil or a cut that is basically, you know, uh, infected. You should not actually handle food. It is always important that you report to your supervisor. This is a sample um, certificate. Now, this is basically a license to a food operation, but even for food handlers, according to the Food Drugs and Chemical Substance Act, CAP 254 of Food Hygiene Regulations, you're supposed to have a food handler certificate and even an operation should be licensed. This is simply a sample and basically that is how it looks like. Very, very important as part of taking care of, uh, you know, uh, food. Then we have personal behavior. How do you behave as a food handler when you're dealing with food in the kitchen or in the service area when you're serving your customers? So it is important that you desist from some mannerisms, some bad habits, like for example, smoking, this is prohibited, it is a no-no, spitting, chewing, or eating. If you have to test your food before you serve it, it is always good to do it professionally. Normally, you need to have a teaspoon and a saucer. You scoop the food, then you walk away from where the food is, you test. And the same, sp same spoon that tested should not actually be taken back to the food, or rather to the cooking pot. So you should do that very well. Do not pilfer in the name of testing for them for the seasoning. So chewing and eating in the kitchen, they are prohibited. You have to eat where it is recommended, okay? Then we have sneezing or coughing over unprotected food. I said sometimes it is inevitable, but these mannerisms are supposed to be. You need to work as a professional, so you avoid sneezing or coughing over food. Uh, touching of your face, the nose, or the mouth. Some people have those mannerisms of fingering. If somebody has a pimple every time, they have to keep, you know, fingering it. Some even very, very uncouth manners of picking the nose, some even rubbing the ears, scratching your head or the scalp. All these are behavior that is prohibited. We have some good pictures or illustrations of them. We can see somebody smoking. It is prohibited. Now, this is someone trying to test food with a soup ladle. It could be a soup and then they scooped it with a soup ladle and they are trying to test it. This is prohibited. You should test it in the manner that I demonstrated clearly. Uh, someone is drinking, and this looks like an alcoholic beverage in the kitchen. This is gum. Somebody is trying to chew gum in the kitchen. It's a no-no. You can see this is, uh, you know, very disgusting. Someone is actually spitting, and they're handling food. Uh, someone is sneezing, or, you know, they're they, they blowing their nose. It is also not allowed in the cook, uh, food uh, preparation or cooking area or service area. Then I talked about nail polish or nail varnish. It is not allowed in the kitchen because it is a major contaminant. I'm now going to summarize personal hygiene rules just as a reminder. Number one, do not work with food if you have any communicable disease or infection. I talked about it, reporting to your supervisor. Number two, bathe or shower daily. We may ask, why should people be reminded? It is not obvious. It is not obvious. So it is good to remind food handlers that they should bathe and shower on a daily basis. Then for the uniforms and the aprons, they have to be clean, it is mandatory. For the hair, it has to be neat always, and they should always wear a hair net, okay? Then uh, if you have a mustache for gents, for the gents, mustache, it should be trimmed, you should not have it. The beards, you're better even clean shaven, you'll be good as a chef. 
Then for the jewelry, remember we said they're not allowed, they're supposed to be removed, even a wedding band, even a watch, because they cause some contamination to food. Wash your hands and expose parts of your arms during this particular time, after eating, after drinking. If smoking is allowed, if you have a smoking zone and you smoked, then you should wash your hands. After using the toilet, that is obvious. After touching or handling anything that may be contaminated with the bacteria, then you need to cover sneezes and coughs, then you wash your hands. Remember I said sometimes a sneeze and a cough is inevitable. So when you do it, wash your hands before you continue with your food. Keep your hands away from your face, eyes, hair, and arm. Those are the prohibited actions. Try as much as, you, uh, as possible. The fingernails should be clean and short. No nail polish. Do not smoke or chew gum while on duty. If you have a cut or a burn, you need to cover it with clean bandage. And if you have done that and you're handling food, wear some gloves, then do not sit on work tables. It is very, very, very important. And that brings us to the end of uh, our lesson. Thank you so much. Until next time, bye for now. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.